Hi guys, good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased and very happy to be joining you guys today on this session. Uh, I thought I was going to probably a shout or a clap or something. Hello guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. So um, welcome everyone. Welcome to this session. Hey. <laughs> thank you very much okay so um before we start i would like to know everyone since it's not really a large class i like to know everyone on the call at the moment so i think i'll be starting from um Dimeji. so you're going to tell me um your name obviously i can see your name but then you tell me your name you tell me um your expectation from this session and then you tell me what you've been up to in the last um, one month. Um, okay, Dimeji says it's in a short meeting. So maybe probably I should move to a maker. Let's see, can I go next? Um, Dimeji, I'm not really sure of what you are sending. Probably I'll start with a maker then. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, my name is uh, Kano Chupemeka Innocent. So, um, what I've been in the last month, in, in the last, uh, so I've been, um, I'm currently a digital marketer. I am, I'm, 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 I'm an IT consultant in a dental clinic. Okay. And, um, and I've been um, diligently and um, I've been diligently studying studying data and data science all this while. So just putting in my best to be a data scientist. Okay. <sighs> Thank you very much, um, Emeka. And I'm very pleased to hear that you are putting in a lot of effort to become a data scientist. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think I should, I don't know if the major is ready, but if he's not, I think I should go with Franklin. There's Franklin on the call, please. Okay, if Franklin is not ready, I think I'm um, Joy. Joy, just- Hello, ready. good morning. Good morning. Hi. Everyone. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> oh, sorry, good afternoon. Okay, my name is Joy Joseph. My expectation from this section, um, from this section is to um, learn and then see how I could um, apply everything then. And then um, lately, or for the past um, three months, I've just been seeing how I could um, <laughs> fit into the new career choice. So that has been what I've been up to. Oh, okay. Okay, okay that's not bad. Thank you very much, Jerry. I really appreciate that you're doing that because really we need more women in the tech industry. So. It's really, a, oh. yes, you know, tech, they always feel like it's a man world, but I feel like this to the guys in the house, you know, I'm just speaking on the fact that, you know. Okay, so um, next is, I think, Miriam. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Miriam. For the past one month, I've been working and um, trying to combine them into uh, my expectations from this webinar is majorly um, as topic says application data science application in industries so like if i can get like exact examples of these applications and specific um like just specific applications of places where they can be applied be wonderful Oh, okay. Nice to meet you, Miriam. Thank you very much for joining in. Um, I would not like to spoil your name, but I'm not sure I can get the pronunciation. Um, it says your son name is Adioye. Please help me out. Please, you can call the name for me so I don't I don't bother the name, please. Hello.
Hello. I can take, I can take it on from there. Okay, so guys, I'm going to turn on my video for a while just to put a face to who we are speaking with. Okay. Um, so guys, welcome to this session. And before I go on, I would just give a brief introduction of myself while I share my screen. All right, yeah. So um, guys, was speaking on um, designing and implementing data science solutions in industry. And my name is Abimbola, Abimbola Maritala. I am currently, I am a data scientist and I currently work with, sorry, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can, you can see it. Yes, yes, I can. Okay, that's fine. But please, okay, one more thing before I continue. Um, please, I like this session to be very, very interactive. Please, if I am speaking and it doesn't feel like you understand what I am saying, please stop me, harass me, and ask me questions. And um, please, let's just make this class very interactive. So we have a long and smooth ride all the way till we are done. Is that fine? That's, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, so briefly, I think I can turn on my video now, so I'm not distracting, <laughs> right? Guys, we're not saying anything. What's going on? We responded. We are yeah, waiting for the. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, like I said, my name is Abimbola Rita. I am a data scientist and I currently work with Blue Chip Technologies Limited. Blue Chip is actually um, a data company. When I mean data, I mean everything data. We deal with databases, um, creating of data warehouses, um, doing advanced analytics, doing data analysis. Um... Yeah, well, someone, someone said something. We do data consulting as well, as well at Blue Chip and everything data, everything you can think of of data at Blue Chip. And um, apart from working as a data scientist at Blue Chip, I also take trainings at um, TriTech Consulting Limited in the United Kingdom. I train people on data, um, on Python for data science and basic Python. That's why I train people. And as well, I train at DT Bank Tech Academy why I also train for Python and Python for data science. Yeah, like my screen says, I am a highly skilled data scientist with extensive experience evaluating machine learning processes, performing statistical analysis to resolve data set problems, enhancing the accuracy of AI products and building data products to solve business problems. So before I go into what we have for today, I would like to speak a little on my journey into data science. I didn't actually start as a data scientist. I started as a Python developer. And I started this when I was in, um, I think my penultimate year in school. But the whole journey, because I studied computer science um, in the Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta. The whole journey started actually during my industrial training. I, I did my IT at um, a debit card company here in Nigeria. The name is Three Line Card Management. That was where I did my IT. And Three Line was into you know, processing a lot of data because of course we're, we're, um, we're creating um, credit cards. And of course we're going to be dealing with a lot of data. And of course we need to be careful with the data First, we need to secure the data because data like that, if it's exposed to the public, there are a lot of things involved. Secondly, it's um, a credit card company, a debit card, sorry, debit card company which deals with money and nobody wants to have a mix up. I don't want to insert my ATM cards into the machine and then I am seeing somebody else's name or I am not seeing my balance or I am not being able to you know, withdraw using my ATM card. So I, we needed to be careful. And that was where the old data thing came. The old data thing started for me. So someone is unmuted, please. Can you mute, please? Thank you. Thank you. 
So that was really where all these data things started for me. And at the time at um, three line, I used to work, I just used to analyze the data and of course prepare the data that should be um, used in, in creating of the credit card. And I used to use just Excel. Well, Excel is a good tool for data analysis. It's a good tool, but it can be pretty stressful sometimes. Pretty auto, um, autonomous, a bit, sorry. It can be pretty boring using Excel. So I, I just wanted to have a different thing. I just wanted to do a different thing, um, a different thing, but still in the data line. And then I already started some programming in school. Then I, I think in my hundred level, I already started writing C and I think C sharp at the time. Then I think in 200 um, C++, but it didn't just stick in. It, it didn't feel like I was getting it. So as a 300, I picked up Python and that was how the whole journey started. I picked up Python. And then in my final year, um, it became, um, it became a tool I started using for data science. My, I remember that my um, final year project was um, um, building a customer churn model for a bank using um, PySpark, that is Python and Apache Spark. That was what my final year project was on. Even though I, could, I didn't get a grasp of it at the time when I was doing that, I did not get a grasp of it. I'm not going to lie, but I tried my best to just make that project be a success but over the years i have kept on you know learning and relearning or learning certain things and i think that is what has kept me going and aside that i kind of have passion for data when i see data even when the data feels and seems like it is meaningless i try to bring out the sense in it connect the dots try to get the patterns in it and i think so far this has worked for me really if if i am to if I am to look back on the years and, and as well look at what keeps me going, I think this has worked for me. Now I uh, currently work, I um, create solutions that work for people, solutions that work for company, help businesses to um, be able to manage, okay, sorry, better manage and better make decisions. And as well, you know, so many other things that I do on this side using data. Um, so I think that's it basically. I don't know if anybody has any question from the list I have said. No questions for now. Still listening. The questions will definitely come All right, that's fine. Okay, so, so the topic of today was speaking about um, designing and implementing data science solutions in industries. Yeah, and um, I believe and I've heard that we have um, actually gone on um, different data science trainings as far the things student has actually been able to train us. I believe that's true, right? Very true, that's true. Yes. So we have been practicing with um, data, probably data from cargo, clean data, and now we're trying to see, okay, how does all these things I have learned, I've learned, sorry, over the um, previous months, I want to see how these things can work for me in industries. We just want to know if it's just something, um, we want to know if it's something people just wake up out of the blues and just start designing anything or writing anything. You know, we're going to be looking at how all of this comes to play, how, lo how all of this actually works. But before I go further, I would like to um, ask, does anybody have an idea of what data science really is? Can anybody explain that to me? In your own little way, any way you think about it, just let's have an interactive section, section please. Uh, okay, in my own little way, um, Data science has to do with um, playing around uh, with data and using data to um, using it to solve problems going to the internet um, or you uh, sorry getting sorry, data. I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm not sure I got you. Can you please come again, please? Okay, I said data science mm -hmm. um, uh, or 
or, or as a data scientist, my job is um, getting data, mm -hmm. um, cleaning up the data, arranging it, and mm -hmm. um, giving it meaning or making meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. Then using that to solve um, one problem or the other, you know, in different places. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that answer. Does anybody have an idea of what data science is again? Just say it in your own little way, anyhow that you think it's, it's yes, actually- Yes, for me, it's just, um, it's just gathering data and then trying to make it clean and then you try to analyze them um, and then just making it um, um, clean or possible for the end users because I, I think the, the major goal is for um, someone that doesn't even know anything about it to be able to understand and comprehend. Um, for me, I would say it's for predicting the future, just to see uh, which predict predicting the future. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else want to give it a, a shot? Hello. Hello. Okay. Um. There's also this report that um, Italy boss and former city manager Roberto Maggi. I don't think the person is talking to us. Oh, okay. Okay, no problem then. Okay, so does, I think I have three answers already. Does anybody else want to try? We're about 17 on this call. Anybody else? Guys, what's going on? This is afternoon already now. Wow, we know very, very up. We need to be up now. Expecting many of them could uh, probably still at work, so maybe unable to speak somehow. Like oh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so briefly, I'll just take it. Right. So, data science is actually, according to Google, data science is actually a blend of various tools algorithms and machine learning principles with the goal to discover hidden patterns from real data. So I think from that simple def definition, the three of us who have been able to um, define data science in our own team are actually right because all of these still make up the data science um, scope at the end of the day. Also from Wikipedia, it says that data science is an interdisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insight from noisy, structured, or unstructured data, and also to apply knowledge and actionable insight from data across a broad range of application domains. Um, I, I think um, the last and most simple definition for data science is Data science encompasses of preparing data for analysis, including cleansing, aggregating, and manipulating the data to perform advanced data analysis. What do I mean by advanced data analysis? Um, advanced data analysis is really where um, all of this machine learning, AI, and all of that, where it comes from. Machine learning cannot work without data. AI cannot work without data. Data, um, data actually, feeds all of these other, all of these other um, parts and um, all of these other fields that we actually term as data science. And that's why it's very easy to call all of that machine learning and AI and all of that. It's very easy to call them data science because it's a process. And the foundation of the whole process is actually data. So it is very easy to do that. 
So we're going to be looking at data science in industries. I'll name the industries that data science are actually very applicable. Then we will go to the skills that are actually needed for data science in these industries. And then we will look at how data science actually apply, um, actually makes these industries, actually make up these industries. Okay, so um, I would like people to just mention industries that you think data science is actually very useful and probably give me use cases where you think data science could come in. Um, I think I like about five to six people do that for me. Um, okay, so we can say automobile industry. Automobile, yeah. Mass driving cars. Okay. Okay, um, in sports. Okay. Okay, the banking industry as well. Banking, okay. Okay, um, I will go with the health industry where uh, okay. we get data to find uh, people that, are, um, that could get heart failures or not, high or low death rates, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, Culture as well. Agriculture. Okay. Is anybody giving me anything else? Education, online learning platforms where they can recommend courses for people based on their profile. Okay. All of these industries that we've actually mentioned, um, data science actually works there. And that's why it is, it is very nice that data science is not just one field that has um, a specific domain where it works. Anywhere that data is being produced, anywhere data is being generated, a data scientist can work there. So you don't really have to limit yourself to certain industries. Sometimes you might think that um, you probably, um, you might want to like be very direct. Okay, so what I mean by very direct is, I might not want to be a, a vast data scientist. I just want to be in one industry or in one field, or maybe to me, I feel like the banking and finance industry is the one that is making all the money. And this is where I want to, or probably I studied accounting in school and somehow along the line, I was able to you know, get into data science and then I want to mix up my data science skills and as well my accounting knowledge to build up something and work in the financial sector, that's very brilliant. If you studied mass communication in school and you're thinking and you say, ah, I have learned data science, I've been able to gather some data science skills. I think I can um, add it up with my mass communication um, knowledge and build up something. Data science is, is a very, 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 very good field, a very, very good occupation. It broadens your knowledge about so many other things that you did not think we, um, you did not think will come to place. Data science actually um, expands your scope. It actually changes the way you think. And one good thing about data science that I have come to realize is me personally, I, I now see that, I now see the need to actually look for facts. And when I mean facts, I'm not just saying things because of, okay, people have been saying it or something. I'm saying things because, okay, I have the data, I can go through the data. If somebody tells me that ah, in, the last one, in the last one year, rain hasn't fallen, I'm not just going to say, ah, yes, that's true, rain hasn't fallen. I'm going to be able to, you know, go back in time, look at my data, look at everything. You know, in, it, it just gives you this kind of confidence that, oh yeah, that's you as a person that I'm speaking about now. I'm not even speaking about the industry. Then on the industry level, data science actually, it broadens the scope of the industry, to be honest. It makes better decision, decisions for the industry. It, it, um, it, it helps the company to as well or the industry to prioritize their needs and their wants. And you know how all of this, at the end of the day, beats down the, um, the money they probably will be spending out and of course help them to increase their efficiency, increase their revenue. And you know how 
that is. So data science is, is, is actually a very, very beautiful field. It's a, it's a field that gives you confidence. You, are, you, you, know, you know what you're talking about. You can predict that, okay, in, in the next six months, we probably will be needing more staff. I'm talking about in the HR, um, in the HR sector now. In the HR, if they have these data science models, they have these data science, um, and if they have this data and can analyze the data and make use of the data, they'll be able to predict when they have turnovers. They'll be able to predict um, um, efficiency within the staff. They'll be able to you know, make a lot of decisions. That's it in the HR field. In the banking industry, we can talk about customer churning. We know how many banks we have here in Nigeria. We know how competitive all of these banks are. The same way um, Bank A is, um, um, is, you know, is trying to advertise their product to you, Bank B is advertising that same particular product, and then there's competition here and there in the banking industry. Me as a business owner, as, the, as a worker in the bank, as the um, CIO or CTO or CEO in the bank, I'll be able to tell and say, okay, this particular customer is joining my bank now. In a few years or in a few months or in a few days, they'll be leaving bank A to go and my own bank A to go and join bank B. If I have this data, I will be able to predict that. And you know what it is? Once a bank can see that, that particular um, thing, they probably will just start giving you a lot of promo, giving you a lot of this, a lot of, you know, that will make you want to stay with them. They don't, they will not lose customers as much because, you know, at the end of the day, these things actually are customer behavior. And you cannot really predict customer behavior like that. Out of a hundred people that the, your model or your data science tool is predicting for you would eventually leave you. I can assure you that if you do the right thing, about 80 of them will stick okay. with you. Even, even with the way we cannot predict customer I get what I, you don't Sorry, can you please mute, mute your mic? Thank you. As well, in the telecommunications um, sector, telecommunications um, industry, at least we have about three major year in Nigeria. And today I can decide that ah, this particular company I've not been able to use their data for the longest time. I need to leave them and move to another um, another um, telecommunication company. I can as well decide to say, okay, as a telecommunication company A, I can decide to say, okay, oh, I want to know those customers that will probably do this at the end of the day. I use my data, I use my model, I use it to get those customers. I will preach, and that's why some of you, if you notice, if you're not um, recharging so much on a particular network, you see them sending you a lot of promo, a lot of bundles, a lot of this. It's because their models are probably already telling them that this person is most likely to leave you guys. And so they want to retain you, they want you to be kept. All these things that happen, they are not magic. Trust me, they are not magic, it's data. It's data that is giving them all this. Of course, and again, you can, you. Um, on the business side, on the business side, it helps companies to, okay, like in telecommunications again now, I can decide to segment my customers. So I can segment them into maybe gold, bronze, silver, different stages, different levels like that. So let's say level one is um, gold, and then I have bronze as level two and silver for level three. And level three customers are customers that are not really really um, recharging or something, I could, I can do a package for them and tell them, okay, uh, 1,500 data um, for seven gig. Every week they get advert on that, that they can do that. Meanwhile, some people have been recharging, they probably recharge almost 10,000 naira every week. And those people are like my top um, contenders in the, sorry, my top customers in the, um, in the company, I'll probably just leave them there. That, okay, you people are paying well, you people are paying my bills. You people don't need the 1,500. You need um, like another promo. You need, um, I'm probably going to take all of you in there for a raffle draw. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That's segmenting of your customers. So there are different things and there are different things that your data actually allows you 
to do. Sorry, there are different things that your data actually allows you to do when you um, in different industries. So um, in the health sector, we know how it is with um, people with diabetes, people with high blood pressure, people with this and that. So if you have the data and we can build a model, we can build a model to find out, okay, how much, um, how many people are going to be diabetic at, the, at what age and this and that, you know, all of that, you can be able to diagnose things if you have the data and, your, and the models are well done. You'll be able to do all of that as well. So before we go into the different types of models that we have for different industries, I would like us to look at the skills that are actually needed as a data scientist. And the first skill, the first, because I split the skills into non-technical and technical parts, because to be honest with you, like I said earlier when I did my introduction, one of the things that has kept me going, apart from my technical skills, is actually my soft skills, my non-technical skills, the skills I, I have as a human being, not as the ones I acquired, right? So the first skill is communication. You, know how, you, you need to know how to communicate whatever model it is you are building. You need to be able to have effective communication with the stakeholders, with the business, you know? You need to be able to speak properly to people. Then the second is data-driven decision-making. They are business people, and you are a data person. Business people can assume anything. They can conclude anything. They can think of anything in their head. In short, they can even come to you as the data person and tell you different things. But any decision you are going to be making for, um, for a company or even for yourself, you are not going to be assuming you should not be assuming anything. You are going to, um, anything you're going to be doing, you have to have your facts. You have to have um, things that you can fall back on, things that you can tell people, show people as proof. So that's what we mean by data-driven decision-making. You need to be able to explain, explain to people, showing them the proof, showing them the data, showing them the facts, not just um, assumptions or conclusions from some things and all that. You need to let your data do your speaking for you. There was one day I was going through LinkedIn and I saw one post and I think I actually like it. It says, um, the more you torture your data, the more it confesses to you. You may see the data and say, this data is absolute rubbish. And you really don't even want to touch it because it doesn't make any sense. Probably just having one, one, one and something. Funny thing is that if you give a data scientist, a data scientist will be able to look at this data and then make some meaning from it, make fantastic patterns from it, and even give you some conclusions from the data that even you yourself did not understand or did not know was in the data at all. So that's what I mean by data-driven decision-making. Then the third one is um, domain knowledge and business acumen. So like I said earlier, when I was explaining um, the different industries. First is, before you can say you want to start making decisions for people or you want to start doing certain things, the first thing you need to do is you need to understand the domain. You need to understand the industry. You need to understand how things work. That particular business or that particular company you are making that decision for or you are building anything for, you need to understand how everything has come about. Yes. They might be in the same industry, but their business line might be different. Like now, we have different tech companies in Nigeria, different tech companies doing different things. You cannot, because you have worked in a particular company, say you want to, you want to go and use the idea in that. Yes, you can use the idea from that company in the other company you are going to, but make sure that you understand what's going on in that other company that you are going to before you even can marry the idea you are bringing from your, from your previous company to your new company, you need to marry the idea together. You cannot just bring up your own. More like, okay, how do I explain? Okay, so like um, a financial company you now, more like you are saying you want to do something for them that has to do with maybe sports, or you want them to be detecting um, um, alcohol usage or something in a financial company. They will look at you like, 
we don't understand what you're saying. So you need to understand what's going on in that domain. And that brings me back to my point where, when I said that if you've studied accounting and you have data science skills, you can marry the two together and decide to be in the financial aspect. If you studied computer science and now you have decided to narrow your computer science to data science and you are now going to a new industry, probably telecommunications, you need to understand what are the rules that go on here? What are the um, political um, 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 rules? What are the economical rules? What are the social rules that go on here? You cannot just assume anything. So that's what I mean by domain knowledge and business acumen. Then another key skill is teamwork. Yes, it's data science, but really these jobs are actually broken down into different, um, different layers. So we have data engineers, we have software developers, we have, you know, we have a lot of different people along the whole chain. It's not just one person doing one thing. A whole lot of people are doing different things. So you need to be able to work in a team. You need to be able to, you know, pass your, and this is where your communication as well comes into play. You need to be able to speak to your team members. You need to be able to explain what you are doing to your team members, you know. You need to be able to carry them along with what you are doing. You need to know when to stop and you need to know when to start. You need to know when you invite other people in and you know when you do your thing. So that's really what that teamwork means. Then the most important one that I myself always tell people is intellectual curiosity and passion for the work. Intellectual curiosity. When you see a data, the only thing that can help you, the only thing that can help you not assume is when you are curious. You need to ask yourself a lot of questions. You need to ask yourself, how does this come in place? So even you yourself, you have to build that curiosity in you. We all have that tendency to be curious. But some of us, some of us are very reserved people. Some of us are very quiet people. We don't like to talk. Some of us are introverts. We are all those things we do even speaking with the business owners is are somewhat shy we cannot really express ourselves you need to be very curious being a data scientist you need to ask a lot of questions even if the project has started and um you have tried to do a couple of things and then it doesn't seem like okay you're getting all of these things in place or getting all of these things right you need to go back and ask questions you need to keep asking questions till you are done creating or building up your model. You need to ask a lot of these questions. So the second bit says passion for work. I said it earlier, that one of the things that has kept me going is because I think I just enjoy anything data. To be very honest, these things could get tiring. There's really no job that cannot get tiring. Every job gets, you know, sometimes it can be very overwhelming. Sometimes it can be just be very stressful. But the only thing that keeps you going is your passion even to learn, even to pick up these skills. Because this is tech. Each and every day, new skills, new, um, there are new technologies, new skills, new everything. So you need to be able to have this passion to even look at these things. If you don't have the passion for the work, you will just see yourself doing the same thing over and over again without any growth. You won't be able to grow. And you probably will even get out of out of the old scope at the end of the day, because where people are already using cloud solutions, we are still battling with on-prem and even the on-prem you've not been able to, you know, you've not been able to even conquer all of it. So you need to have passion for the work. You need to have something that keeps you going in all of this. Another thing is good data intuition. Good data intuition means you know when, you know the type of data to gather. But no, don't let us be talking about how to, how to solve the problem of cancer. And you are trying to gather data for um, maybe eyesight or something, or probably data from another even industry entirely. You need to be able to know, you know, even before beating or torturing the data, you need to be able to have an idea of which data actually works for what. So that's what that means. The project management skills, that particular one, what that means is, you need to be able to own the project. Some of us cannot actually um, own project. We don't take responsibility for the project. You need to be able to own the project. And what do I mean by own the project? You need to be able to tell people that, okay, 
this is what I'm going to be doing on this project. This is um, German. German is not pretty. I'm asking, is it presenter? Or is it journalist? As well as a journalist. A journalist looks for the new. A and presenter is just they yeah. write. A journalist okay. writes. Okay, there is one director. Hello. Yeah. Okay, so. Sorry, I didn't know my mic was on mute. Okay, no problem then. Okay, so um, project management, you need to be able to, able to own the project. You need to know that, you need to be able to give a timeline for when this project will be done. Yes, there are some times that you have gathered your data, done your data cleansing. In short, you've gotten to the point where you have started training your machine learning model. But um, along the line, the output it is giving you is doesn't really correlate, doesn't really make sense. And you already have a timeline. You need to be able to, okay, in four weeks, in five weeks, I will be done with this project. I'll be able to have done this. So, and what may I just advise people is, even if you know that this model is something you have worked on before, because regardless of the industry, you still need to tailor your idea or your solution or your model to that particular industry or that particular company, you need to tailor it because most companies don't use the same data. They have, you know, they have different data, even if they're in the same industry, even if they're in the same domain, there are different companies and they have their own. So even if you have done something like, let's say a customer churn model, I have done it in a telecommunications company and now I'm moving to the banking and finance company. In telecommunication company, probably took me four weeks to do. If you are going to banking and finance, you probably will be asking for eight weeks or 10 weeks. You need to be able to say, okay, yes, this is what I'm going to be, you know? So that's what I mean by project management skills. So going further, I'm going to, um, I, I, I don't know, have I been able to make some sense? Yes, yeah. a lot of yeah. sense. Thank you. Okay, so I've looked at the non-technical skills and I don't know, does anybody have any question for me? Non-technical skills. I know these skills, over time, experience will make you get, gather all of these skills. That's the truth. These skills are not skills that can actually be learned. But, but over time, experience would you know, shape you into all of this. Does anybody have any question for me? Yes, 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 I do. Okay. Yeah, my name is Tim Tope. Okay. Hi, Tim so, Tope. Hi. I'm a geographer and a GIS analyst. Okay. I do GIS basically. So I love data science a lot. Okay. It's um it's helped me understand um, more about uh, GIS because when you do GIS, you tend to do a lot of uh, data manipulation and, and the rest. So I'm curious. I I can't wait to start learning shake it. So I just, uh, the, I want to, the project management skills is, I just want you to like, can you relate it a bit to the geospatial industry? Mm, so for the project management skills, like I said earlier, what I just mean about the project management skills is, okay, so project managers in the real sense, what they do is they own the projects. They are the owners of the project. They're the ones that know, that can give the timeline. They're the ones that give, um that keep up with the project basically that's what project managers do am i right if i'm wrong you can correct me please hello yeah you're right you're exactly. right so here you are building a model for a company a model that is supposed to provide solutions for the company so the best thing for you to do is know how you are going to own these projects even, even though you have a project manager that you are going to be reporting to, project managers, their own is just do this work and let me see the outcome. Whatever stress you are going through, whatever thing you are doing, they really do not know. They really cannot tell. Right? Am I right or wrong? You're right. It is left to you. It is left to you to know all of the effort you are putting in it. So that's why that's why I'm saying that you need to even be the project manager of your own self before you even report to your your the real project manager on that project i don't know if i answered your question you do yes okay. you did all right thank, thank you very you. much yeah does anybody okay. else have another question for me the question please 
um, from okay. what you said, uh, okay, so if, um, for example, I work in an MTN, I work with MTN, and um, okay. uh, I train the data that takes a very long time okay. and come up with um, a train data set, for example. So yes. they have that saved. And let's say I go over to um, Etisalat and I mm -hmm. see something similar. Okay, so that means um, from what you're saying, it's not advisable to take that, uh, that trained data set I saved from MTN and um, apply it in, M uh, in uh, Airtel or, or Etisalat, hoping to get um, you know, the same or, or a good, um, what's that called, prediction. Okay. Or something yeah, similar. Thank you for that for that question. So there are actually some projects. There are actually some products, some models like natural language processing. Of course, you speak English. You know all of that. You can, of course, take your same um, training data that you have at MTN for all of that. But let's go to the financial aspect. You know, we regardless of them being in the same domain, being in the same sector, they do not make the same revenue. Do you agree with me? Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yes. Even at them being in the same domain and same sector, their mode of working is quite different. Do you agree with me? Um, yes, I do. So this is one, these are just few of the reasons you cannot bring a training data set from MTN to Nine Mobile. Gather your data at Nine Mobile again. You can use the same approach you use in gathering your data, in cleaning your data, and all of that. Because of course, you are just lifting that idea, and you are using the same idea in Nine Mobile. But the same data, we need to change the data. Except the generic models, like um, face mask detection model. Now you can use any kind of data. You can even get the data from the internet. But something like customer churn something like customer segmentation, um, things like um, cash management, you know, those different type of tools, cross-sell, cross-sell, you know what I mean by cross-sell? Cross-sell means when you're trying to um, match up products for, for a customer, you're trying to sell like, okay, you were able, you bought, you've been buying this product and this other product, um, other customers have been buying this product. I think you should try this product. We cannot carry that data from MTN to Nine Mobile because they obviously have different products. Okay. I don't well, know, did I answer your question? Yes, you did, you did. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody else have another question for me? Why are you guys quiet now? I don't like you are quiet. We're supposed to be speaking. No, I don't. My colleagues. You guys are my colleagues. So we're supposed to be sharing our ideas together right now. This was just gisting about what's happening in the industry. Okay. In the absence of no other question, I would like us to move to the technical skills. I know that some of us have actually been doing a lot of research. Some of us have even been taking several courses on data science. Some of us have done so many other things. Some of us have even gone above and beyond um, different um, skills, acquired different skills in data science. So please, if you don't see your skill on my screen at the moment, it doesn't mean that your skill is not important or is not useful in data science. They are just some, everybody has their tool that they use, right? Some people do not like to, um, to program, some people do not know how to code. So they do rather use all of this auto, auto ML where they just do drag and drop and all of that. Some people, you know, so different to just use the one that works for you. Mind you, you have also have to put into consideration a tool that is going to last for long. A lot of these drag and drop tools, people actually program them to be drag and drop. They might, they might have limitations. That's why most times I advise people, please try to learn these programming languages. A, a programming language, the highest that work on is they release another version, but it still does not take the basics of whatever it is that you have learned previously. You will just adjust to the new version. But some of these tools, 
some actually release latest version, some they just have one version. And technology, the way technology works, it keeps moving, it's not stagnant. So there are a lot of tools to actually use. So if you see my screen, I've been able to divide the tools used in data, end-to-end -end data. That means I'm talking about data engineers up onto the de deployment. So if you see my, my, my screen right now, you can see the different tools here. It's the one for data sources, the one for ETL. ETL means extract, transform, and load. The one for data processing, data exploration, model building, model management, model deployment, SaaS, that's software as a service. There are some um, tools like that. Then cloud ETL, you know, right now, the way we have on-prem uh, on prem solutions, we as well have cloud solutions too. So data warehouse um, tools, we have traditional BI tools and we as well have the modern day BI tools as well. You know, all of these things. So I would just like us to, you know, just list a few technical skills that we've been able to pick up along the line, even if it's one month into, into data science now, even if it's um, a week into data science, I know that we've been doing researches and that's why we're even on this call at this time and we're interested, that's why we're on this call at this time. So I just like us to list different tools that we think um, actually work and why we think it works or probably tools that we're working with at the moment and why we think, you know. Um, can anybody help me out? I just need, I need a few people to help me out on that. Uh, so help you out on what? Okay, so I'm speaking about the technical skills now. The technical skills used in different industries for data science. Okay, before I go into that, I'd just like to speak about a few skills that most companies, because I know that most of us are on this call because of job opportunities and all of that. So I'd just like to speak, speak about some technical skills that um, companies actually employ people um, for in data science. Okay, so a few applications I have seen, they usually ask for Python, they ask for your SQL, structured query language, they ask for R. Some companies would ask for Python in place of R. Some companies will ask for R in place of Python. They are very similar. And some companies will ask for both, you know. Then um, some companies would include that uh, you have Power BI, Tableau, Altrix, you know, Click, um, Luca, Grafana, and all of that. Some companies will ask for you to have that. Some companies, but the major ones basically is SQL, Python, R, a bit of Microsoft Excel sometimes. And there are the visualization tools like um, Power BI, Tableau, and all of that. So does anybody else have any um, tool that you've been working with and you just like to know, okay, what's going on with this tool? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, it's Tim Topper. Yeah. I've been, uh, I, I, I know a bit of Python. Okay. So I'll be trying to pick up uh, R for about two months now. Okay. So my question is, eh, okay. do you, must you be grounded in R to actually be a data scientist? Like, because it's like R is um, also very, very good, like statistically speaking. Yes, R is actually very good. And the syntax of R is very, very similar to that of Python. Yeah. Very similar. So if you can pick up Python, you can pick up R. But I always advise people, don't wait till the time you know it all before you start applying for jobs. Once you are sure of the basics that you already know and you have done a couple of things that you are proud of that you can show to your, um, to your employers, please apply for jobs. This job, you cannot know everything if you're not actually in the system. It's when you get into the system that you can you can be able to even call yourself a data scientist. Because when you're outside now, it seems like, oh, you're getting clean data from cargo. OK, let me just give a brief um, story. So I actually learned, I'm a self-learned data scientist. I, I kind of just um, got courses from Udemy, from Udacity, and all of that. That was when I was in university. 
And I just used to um, get my data set from Cargo. That was what I was doing then. In that, that time, I just used to get my data set from Cargo, try out my hands on different things, uh, alongside run the courses I got until I got to work. So what I, what I had there, I was, then I was able to use it to apply for a job and I got the job. And one day I was thrown to um, a telecommunications company here in Nigeria, where I had to you know, build a customer churn model for them. That was my first time, my first time ever working with raw data. And anybody that has this cargo here, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to relate to what I'm saying that cargo gives you clean data sets. You might not even see any missing missing value in cargo, you might not see any of um, any error or anything in any of the columns in cargo, but this is new live data set, raw data set where human um, human error could have happened, system error could have happened, anything at all could have happened data type issue, all of that could have happened. And this was my first time on that project. What did I do? I only just took the basic skills I already knew and I started and I got to work. It was on that project that I began to learn new things that I didn't even know existed. I got into a lot of errors. I'm not going to say, yes, I did this project without errors. I got into a lot of errors, but I was able to pull through because yeah. I'd always been practicing with even the clean data that I had. So all that was in my head was you need to clean up this data to a point where you are very comfortable to even continue um, with all the skills that you've gathered from your cargo data set. So that is it. And that is what I always advise um, people who are new to data science. Even after practicing, even after all your all the courses you are taking, you still will fall into a lot of problems when you when you decide to um to get a job being a data scientist even the best of the best data scientists they still get errors we all still run to do good we run to stack overflow so please guys apply for jobs if you get the job or when you get the job if you face any error or any of the or any challenges don't be scared don't feel like anybody's going to cut off your neck you the only way you can help yourself from all of that issue is to run to cargo sorry is to run to stack overflow there's a um, stack exchange as well. There, there are a lot of a lot of things on Google for you. You're not the first person that's going to experience that error. Trust me. The moment you copy the error out and you paste it on Google, you're going to see solution. Trust me. So, um, Senator, I hope I've been able to answer your question. Um, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a lot, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you too. Um, does anybody else have can any I, Can I ask you a question? Okay. Go on. Yes, I do. Okay, um, you said you could uh, choose right, then would get better on the job. Yes. If I get, if I got you right. Okay. Yes. Now, for some of us, still, we're still not done with um, the curriculum, the curriculum to becoming um, a data scientist, so to say. Mm -hmm. So, can we still get and apply as well? So the, the thing is, some of these companies actually put a year, um, they put years of experience restriction on it. My advice for that, because I always tell people, apart from all of these things, grace also comes into play. But apart from grace, help yourself as well. There are some, there are some um, jobs that actually, they actually put it out, some applications actually put it out that they want so, 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 so years of experience. But sometimes someone could have almost 14 years of experience being a data scientist and someone and another person will have three years of experience being a data scientist and the person already has a lot of models that the person has worked on. The person can explain in depth. The person can, you know, the, you, you already see the person as a resource in your company. Please, who are you going to go with? Yeah, true. No, my, my question, my question yes, is. No, I'm just asking. I'm just, I, I, I don't ask that question. I want you to, to tell me. Okay, of course, the resource person. Exactly. Of course, the resource person. So even if you're just starting up, starting out as a data scientist and you're not done with the curriculum, all the other things that you have learned previously, how have you been using them? How have you tried to master the art of the other things you have, you have learned previously? Okay. So I got I got that. 
So that's it basically. That's it basically. Just keep on putting the work. Let the work be very evident. Let your skills do the talking for you. Even the little that you need, let you do the talking for you. Some people will learn Python in three days. The next day, they're already jumping into Python for data science, and then they call themselves data scientists. Well, if good enough, they can prove it that they are data scientists. Of course, anybody will employ them. Anybody that sees them resourceful will employ them, right? So does anybody have any question for me again? The ladies yeah. are very quiet, and I don't know why. What a question. Thank you, please. OK. OK, so um, as newbies, we are newbies. I'm a newbie, and I'm still starting this training. Um, I started learning Python with students and um, Python right. and that, which is the school. So okay. Just... Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear you. You was breaking at the time. Okay. That's fine now. Okay. So, um, so right now I'm still a, a newbie, as I said. So I want to know what exactly are the technical skills you will advise me to go for as once I'm done. Yes, I said newbie once I'm done here. What else? Okay, so, what you, you advise me, you know? Okay, so like, I know that I've seen Stoughton's um, curriculum and I I feel like they actually put people on the track, on the right track. But me, basically, what I what I tell my mentee is learn SQL, learn Python, learn any visualization tool you are comfortable with, be it Power BI, be it Altrix, be it Tableau, Luca, anyone you are comfortable with. Why Just give, am me, I give me one amongst those Tableau or BI. I, Which I cannot you give you one because price? I do not want to be, I'm not an ambassador for any one of them. So anyone is fine. The thing is, they are very, very similar. And if you know one, it's going to be very easy to move into the other. That's the truth I'm telling you. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's the truth I'm telling you. Just, you can pick anyone. So most times I, I tell my mentees, SQL, Python, and any of the visualization, visualization tools. That's it. And what really keeps you going is being able to torture that data, analyze the data, understand the data. We'll get there. We, we still have some explanation to do in that aspect. But let me keep taking questions. Please, a question. Um, this tableau which you said they are visualization tools and uh, that, did they, is it like they do they do the same work with matplotlib or is it something different with matplotlib yeah they are actually very very matplotlib is like the visualization library in python and these ones are just tools that microsoft or um, oracle or any one of them built for visualization so they are very similar okay, okay. just that you're not right any well, just a few lines of code. It's not like serious coding and all of that. So you can, you know, you can pull through. I'm very confident about that. Okay. Yeah. So my ladies, what's going on? You don't have questions for me. I don't have question. No. Is it that I'm not speaking into the language that you guys really like or you guys really understand? No, no. The thing is. Some people ask, and then I'm able to gather one of the things. Oh, okay. So, does anybody have else have any question for me? Either speaking about the non-technical skills or the technical skills required in this industry. So, I would assume we are fine with the with the silence. Okay. So here we are. I'm going to speak about data science life cycle. I decided to speak about the industry because to be honest, I'm not going to lie to you. Designing um, solutions and implementations um, in data science, we actually have a workflow that I'm sure even professional data science, so, um, more experienced data science, data scientists they use. There's a particular workflow then um, it now depends on the way you do it, what there is a standard workflow that everybody uses. And that is why I decided to speak about organizations as a whole, not being specific to any organization. 
because I wouldn't even like to limit newbies to just one organization. Newbies should be able to see um, the use of data science in different organizations and let them pick for themselves, not somebody telling them that, okay, telecommunications is the best and the financial sector is the best, transportation is the best, no. You can explore, you can be the first person to even start in any industry or any organization. You can be the first person to start data science there. It doesn't necessarily have to be one particular um, industry. Okay, so there's a data science life cycle. Uh, sorry, please okay. add to that. Um, okay. Are newbies allowed to equally choose a company depending on pay? What did you say? Can you come again? Yes, are newbies equally, can newbies equally choose where to work depending on the, the strength of pay? Income. Yeah. Well, my advice for people, that's another advice I always have for people, is sometimes you need to put in, you need to look for the experience before you start looking for the pay. Please don't take, don't get me wrong. If the pay is nice and the experience is nice as well, very good. But if there is going to be a lot of experience there, you're going to be able to hold on to a lot of things. If the company is going to be giving you a platform or better still, let me use the word in Nigeria, they're going to be giving you exposure into the old data science thing, you know, advanced analytics team. I think that's not a bad idea. But if it's just about only the money for you, well, I think you need to think it through again. That, that's my advice. Thank you. So yeah. Can I go on? Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, so for data science life cycle, there's actually a flow that everybody follows across your level in data science. The first thing is you need to identify the problem. And how can you identify the problem? I can't just walk into a company and tell them, except, okay, for different companies that they have different products. So um, let me take GT Bank as an example. It's an example, though, not like that's what's wrong or anything, though. It's just an example, please. Um, their mobile app, I probably would just see that their face verification on the mobile app is not very efficient enough. And this is one problem that I've been able to identify from outside, not being a staff of GT or being, you know, just being a customer of GT, I've been able to identify that problem and have been opportuned to go into GT, give them this problem, and then them too, they're like, ha, they are like our Messiah because we too, we have been looking at this problem, we don't know how to fix it. You need, there needs to be a problem. Believe me, you, there are problems everywhere. Everywhere, every industry has, every company has one problem or the other. The problem just needs to be identified. Some companies don't even know it is a problem until when, someone calls the attention to it or something happens. Some, some companies don't know it is a problem, right? So a problem needs to be identified. You need to identify that, okay, a lot of our customers are leaving. A lot of our staffs are leaving. We are not employing staffs that are very, very, very um, efficient enough for the work we're doing. All of that falls into HR analytics anyways. There's a problem somewhere. We're only employing people that are um, probably, we're employing only people that are maybe a, a particular religion. That's those are the people we're attracting to our company. There's a problem somewhere. Our customers are leaving us. Our customers are not buying like before again. The revenue getting into the banks are not um, up to par again. The revenue getting, my shop, I cannot, I don't know the products that people like in my shop. There's a problem everywhere. So that problem needs to, needs to be identified. You need to identify that problem. That's the first step and the first bit to it. Because you can't just come out of the blues and say you a problem that has been identified or a solution that it works or something. You say you want to come and, you know, you need to identify that problem. Then the next thing after identifying the problem is you need to understand the business. So this is where, you see, this is where your communication skill needs to come in. Communication skill. Okay, let's, let, me, let me put it as your passion for the work comes in at problem identification stage. Because if you're passionate about your work, you're going to be able to see these problems. You will see the problems. I'm not going to lie to you. You will see the problems. It's now left to, you know, some companies, they might be like, ah, 
we don't have money to deploy this, you know, all of that. Though most companies don't do that anyways. Most companies will listen to you because you are you are making a good decision that will bring you more revenue for the company. And of course, the solution is very cost effective. So they will not, you know, they will not scream or shut it out. They will always listen. So business understanding, this is where your communication skills come into. You need to be able to communicate with the stakeholders, the CEOs, the CIOs, the CTOs, the heads, team leads. You need to be able to, you know, you need to be able to understand the business from point to point. You know, you need to be able to understand, okay, this is how Nine Mobile runs. This is how um, Zenit Bank runs. This is how MTN runs. This is how um, Divine Medicals, this is how they run. This is how they operate. This is what goes on in their company, in their company in the organization they don't let staff in they let staff work from home this is their policy this is you need to understand the business because all of this you are going to be able to you know along the line you're going to be able to fit them in into different buckets and different you know when you're making your decision you need to put into consideration a lot of things for example now very relatable if i want to sleep i need to put a lot of things into consideration this sleep that i want to sleep in the afternoon when i'm supposed to be doing a remote work what is it going to do for me at the end of the day will i be able to finish my work before the end of the time with, with this sleep if i sleep will i get better do i need to do this before i sleep you know all of that you need to understand you need to you need to understand everything that is happening you need to be able to communicate back and forth have a very clear communication let everybody be on the same page and as well, you are communicating to these business people because business people only know that, okay, they don't know what's going on. So you need to speak the language that they understand. You need to, you know, you need to be able to bring everybody to the same page and everybody understands that this is what we're going to. You don't have to be all technical all the time when speaking to business people. You need to be able to know, you know when to switch it to business, you know when to switch it to technical, you know. So that's um, business understanding and communication and the communication bit. So the next thing is data acquisition. So data acquisition is more like you are gathering your data. Like I said earlier, I cannot be having a problem in a finance in the finance sector and say I want to start gathering medical data. That doesn't make any sense. I need to gather data in that company. I need to be sure that they have the data. I need to be sure that all these things, this particular problem that I'm trying to solve. I'm going to be able to get the data from this company. And this is where your ETL comes to play. And like I said before, ETL means extract, transform, and load. It means that I'm extracting all these data from different sources. So one good thing about data these days is that all the companies are being very aware of data and they are storing data into a particular, um, into a, into a particular source now, probably data warehouse or database or anything. People are storing their data now. So you as the data scientist, you can collaborate with the data engineers to be sure that, okay, this data that I am looking for are actually um, something that this company has. If we need to get external data, like there was one project I did at the time, um, that project, even that project, the um, company did not have sufficient data. So I had to, get external data more like i had to scrape a website to get data sometimes if you're working for a bank you probably need to scrape cbn website to get some data from cbn website to add to the i don't know if you understand what i'm saying what i'm saying at the end of the day is just be able to gather your data into one point right after gathering my data i need to understand the data and that's where that um those words that i said earlier came from when on the data understanding means I'm going to go through this data. I will torture my data until it confesses more than enough for me. My data must confess a lot of things for me. I must be able to pinpoint. If they said, if, they, if my data is saying that a customer left on so, so, so date, I must be able to figure why that customer left. Why did the, cost, why the customer left? Um, I will be able to go back to my data, look at the customer, look at the same customers that have, that have been following that trend. Is it because my customer care has not been so efficient to, um, to these customers? Is that why they are leaving? Do I need to reduce my prices? What is going on? Why is every, you need to understand the data. You need to ask yourself a lot of questions. 
why, where, how, what. You need to ask yourself all of those questions and your data must be able to answer those questions for you. So one beautiful thing about data understanding, like I told one of my mentees recently, because I gave her the Titanic data set. I know most of us are very familiar with the Titanic data set. And she just came with the normal questions. And then she just came with the normal report. And I showed her, I said, see, this is my own analysis on the Titanic data set. You can see it's answering almost more than 50 questions. Just that data, the way the data is just very small. I think the data is about 891 rules. Over 50 questions are being answered from my analysis because you need to keep asking questions. You need to get to a point where you are like, okay, yes, this is, you, you even need to understand the data say, more than the business people. So you need to torture that data. I, so I told my, um, my mentee then when she came and showed me that, okay, this is, this is what I've been able to come up with. I said, no, go back. Go back and go and torture this data again. You are not, you have not understood this data. Then I asked her a few questions. I asked her a few questions and she wasn't able to answer me because she didn't get that fact from her data. She has not been able to ask herself. So I told her, I said, get a pen and a book. For newbies, I would advise to do that really. Get a pen and a book, ask yourself the questions like you are interviewing yourself. Ask yourself those questions, then go back to your data. If you are using Python, anything you're using for your data analysis, even if it's Excel you're using, make sure that your data is answering those questions you have asked yourself for you. Don't assume, don't conclude. Make sure that your question, your data is answering those questions for you because it gives you more understanding. It even allows you to even know what makes you go. And of course, it makes your model more robust. Really, if you ask me, it makes your, your model very robust. Okay, so, sorry. Can you still see my screen, guys? Yes, yes. Okay, so if you look at my screen, from the data understanding, you see that it points to data visualization and feature engineering. So I'll take them in bits. So to so data visualization, right? I might want to be doing, I might want to do a report I might want to show the business people. I know business people, they like colors. They don't want to see numbers. They don't want to see figures. They like colors, they like graphs, they like all those things. So that's where your data visualization bit comes in. You can decide to use Matplotlib. You can decide to use Power BI. You can decide to use Tableau. You can decide to use any visualization tool, but make sure that any visualization you are doing um, for your customers or doing for yourself, because sometimes you might even understand the data more when you do visualization for yourself. Just make sure that it's in the proper shape, in the proper form and very readable, very ex ex um, explainable that even when you are not there, anybody can pick it up and understand what's going on. Anybody, if it's line graph that you're using, let people understand what the lines are doing, you know? so. That's where data visualization comes in. Another thing about business understanding is we all know that some of these companies have, um, um, they have this color thing. Some companies don't like to see some colors on their visual. So by the time you do your business understanding and you speak to them very well, you know what they want. So when you are doing your visualization, you are not making a mistake. You are giving them exactly what they want, the way they will understand it, right? So. The other arrow from data understanding goes to feature engineering. So what does feature engineering mean? So when you understand your data, you'll be able to point out new columns. You'll be able to point out new columns. Probably you need to add some things together. Probably you need to divide. Probably, you know, you know so many things that would make your, your machine learning model, so many things that would make it very robust that even when new features come into the model, the model knows what to do. So is that feature engineering that all of that happens? You probably need to um, um, transform your data, pre-process your data. You need, you need to change from, because we all know that machine learning models, you can only pass in zeros and ones. You can't pass in alphabets, you can't pass in characters. So feature engineering is where all of those things happen. More like you're pre-processing your data, you're transforming your data, all those things happen at that point, a feature engineering. So model creation is where I'm looking at my model. And of course, bear it in mind that at understanding my data, 
and the problem identification. I've already understood if it's going to be a regression, classification, segmentation, any of those um, machine learning models. So I already have that in my head. So model creation, Model creation is where I train my data and as well validate my data. So I, you know, I'll create, um, I'll pass, I'll create a training set and a test set for my data. And why am I creating a test set or validation set for my model? I want to be able to train on, 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 some, on some data set because I'm training my model on historical data, so I want to be able to train on some and then test that my model, if it's going to give me accurate answers for the remaining bits, probably 20% or 30% thereabout, but just always make sure that your training percentage is always higher than your test percent. You could do 80, 20, 80, 20, you could do 70, 30, please don't let it be more than that. Don't try to even bring them half, half. It's not going to work. Your, let your training set always be more than your test set. So that's where model creation comes about. That's why I pick which is my logistic regression model. Is it doing better than my random forest? Is my random forest doing better than my decision trees? Do I need to move from that? Do I need to move to deep learning? Do I need to do neural networks? Do I need, what do I need to do? That's where that um, decision is made at model creation. So model creation moves straight down to model deployment. So model deployment at this point, I'm deploying my model. And this is what the organization wants to see. This is what works for the organization. When you are deploying your model, it now depends on the organization. It depends on what work that model is going to be doing. Are you going to be doing a clone, a clone job? Are you going to be doing an API? Is it a mobile, a mobile, um, a mobile app? Is it a web app? Anything that that's going to be, that is where model deployment comes into play. After you have tested your model, you have, you know, you have tested your model, you have done everything, and you are very certain of your model. That is where it comes to play at model deployment. Then, when you deploy your model and it's working, you've created an API, or you've created a mobile app, or a web app, or you are doing a cone job, any of those things you are doing, you can do anything. Anything could be your endpoint at the end of the day. You need to keep monitoring your model. Let's not say we're creating a model that detects face mask. Of course, in the, in the era of this COVID, let's not say we're creating a model or building up a model that is detecting face mask. And then at some point, my model stops. And you know, I've created this, um, this model for security purpose. And then even when you're not wearing your face mask, even if you just tie a, a, an handkerchief on your nose, my model is letting you in. So you need to keep monitoring your model. After all of that, you need to keep monitoring your model. You need to, you know, you need to be sure that your model is working well. Then from model monitoring, we can see model drift analysis. So model drift analysis are like, you're giving your model exception. Exceptions like, okay, if this happens, what's going to happen? You know, that's where model drift actually comes in. Then the last bit to it is creating dashboards, reports, or scores. So the business owners now, they always want to see how effective your, your model is. Okay, where well we having a churn rate of about 30% before, after your model came in, we've been able to reduce our churn rate to 10%. We've been able to reduce it by 15%. Business owners always want to do this. They always want to see this. So you need to show them this from time to time. Sorry, just give me. Okay, I'm sorry guys, I have to take that. It was work call. I had to take that and kind of had to um, wrap up all I have been saying in a bit because I need to attend to work. So basically, like I was saying, just the dashboard and then reports because you have to give back to the business owners. The business owners have to know that, okay, this is actually very effective for us. This is actually working for us, right? So um, having said this, I don't know, does anybody have any question for me? Please, I have a question. So, okay. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think I understood every step you took here. Um, but I have a question where, you know, on the model deployment. So you said um, when you 
for a mother, you only need to monitor it. Yeah. So, so let's assume in your case, I know you must have deployed a lot of models, several okay. of them over the years, uh, over time. And um, I don't know, normally when you deploy a model, I believe they will instantly um, apply it and start using it maybe in an app or in one particular place or the other for mm -hmm. it to work. So uh, how would you know? Or how do you monitor these models to go back and know whether they're still producing results? Whereas you have several of these models aligned that you've already created over time, or over the years yeah, in, the, so, in the company. So, so, okay, sorry to cut you. So um, when you're building your machine learning models, you need to give some time where you have to retrain. And why did I say that? Because, um, for instance, now in the cybersecurity um, space, every day there's a new, there's a new, um, either a new virus or a new, there's a new malware. There's a new approach to how these um, um, attackers, these cyber criminals, there's a new way to how they handle these things. So the way they are not sleeping, you too, you must not sleep. So once you see, once there's a new future, there's anything, you will surely see it because that's why even after monitoring your model, you are creating dashboard and report. So you will surely know that your model is not being efficient again. Then that is where you have to go back and take the step again. You need to retrain, you need to, if you need to add more data, you need to, you know, you need to do all of that again. And if I heard you well, you said um you are um okay, you said. In a space where I have deployed several models, yes, that's true. In a place where I have deployed several models, how then am I able to monitor this thing? What the bit to that, the honest truth is when you get to that stage or that stage, you will know actually that you need to create a way around this. Am I going to create like um, a dashboard that shows me all of these things? Because at the end of the day, the business owners will not face and the customers or the other, it is I who deploy the model of the business owners will face. So you need to create a way around that where you are able to monitor your model. You are able to test and retest. I keep doing that. You need to keep doing that because of course, even in even in um, smart driving cars, you don't want to throw your car to turn left and your car is turning right. So you need to keep retraining your model. That's the truth. You can't just say you have deployed the model and just leave it. You need to retrain. Even because of new features, you need to retrain. So you could give it a timeline. You can say, okay, every three months, I want to be retraining my model. I want to retrain every six months. I want to retrain every year. So it just depends. Is that right? Is that fine? Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. All right. Um, does anybody else have any question for me? No, I don't. Okay. Um, Tim, do you have any question for me? No, I don't. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Okay. My name is Toby. Um, okay. I need. I want to ask a very new big question. So, I'm um, talking about training models and uh, monitoring them. What platform do we use for this? Um, training models and monitoring them. So if you want to train models, okay. um, for newbies, I actually always advise newbies to use Jupyter Notebook. Why do I advise them to use Jupyter Notebook before going to production? Because if you use Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Notebook gives you an output at each, um, at each run of your code or like um, production environment where you probably need to run all of your code and might not be able to trace the error easily because you are a newbie. But if you use Jupyter Notebook, you'll be able to get where the error is immediately. So for, that's for training of models. So for model monitoring, um, I would suggest that for newbies, it is just best that you create probably a report that, or maybe an alert system that makes you understand when and where your model stops, is not acting or is acting weird. You can do that as well for model monitoring. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. So, um, any questions? Any other question? Okay. So, if a model has been 
um, created, uh, we've trained and trained the model and prepared the model using a uh, Jupyter notebook, like you mentioned. So how exactly, like we want to now eventually use the model, um, how exactly is it supposed to be deployed? Okay, so um, there's object-oriented um, object oriented programming in Python, where you can um, define a class and um, alternate your scripts. So um, that's why I said along the line, all these things come with the experience. And I'm sure that when you get there, you'll be able to, you'll be able to pull through. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. All right. Um, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Before we go into the industry and um, the industries and the different models that are being built for these industries. Um, sorry, production level. Okay. Thank you. I was using um, you know, Jupyter Notebook. What other ones, like how is it done on the production level itself? Yeah, so it's just like um, the software engineering bit. You can usually, you can use either VS Code or you use IntelliJ or you use PyCharm. Just that like you're writing a more advanced, you're just going to place your codes in, um, like I said, define a class where you have all of this so that you can automate the process easily. So, but, um, Jupyter Notebook actually allows for that, but in production terms, it's actually always easier and better to do it using those IDs. Okay, okay. all right, thank you. Yeah. I, I have another question, please. So at what point in um, learning Python, or what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is how, um good so does one have to be at python for one to be able to start building models and all um so i i i think that that is very relative to any to different people um i feel like when you are already very confident of yourself you've been able to learn the basics of python and you are confident of the code you are writing you can then pick up data science and learn data science along the line and trust me, when you start learning data science, you probably will see a need to go back to your Python basics to relearn and unlearn certain things. So that's very relative to people. It doesn't have to be like you have to get to a particular point before you can move. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, please. I want to ask this. I always hear this basics of Python. What, what, what is that? Um, could you just define the basics of Python, like from where to where? Okay. Oh, oh, from where to where? Okay. So I think the basic of every programming language is quite, um, is quite um, the same across all languages. You learn using for loop how to define a function, how to print statements, how to do your if-else statements, your decision statement, how to, um, I think, um, different all the basic syntax that you need to know in Python, how to use all your aggregate functions, how to, you know, all of those things are like the basics of Python. If you, when you can confidently pick up a, pro, um, a particular project or a, pro, um, a particular program and write that program, even if you have to use Google to write some of those codes. And of course, if you are just copying what you don't know from Google, of course, even you, you will have that confidence in you. But if you run into um, a, a problem or a challenge while writing your code, and you decide to, to search for an answer on Google, it is not a bad thing. Yes, you are still on track, but when you go to Google to copy the, all of the code and then you're just doing copy and paste of the code and you're running it, um, I think you need to improve more on that. So that's it basically, when you just can, you're just very confident of yourself. Thank you. All right. 
Um, does anybody else have any question for me? Um, sorry, one question. Okay. Please, what was the use of Flask in the um, okay. general? Flask is actually a Python library which the, um, deals with the web framework. Um, it deals mostly with the backend of um, websites. So if you see um, if you see some websites, their yeah, backend is probably Python Flask or Python Django. So it has to do with web. If, it's actually a, a, a good library and a good framework to actually learn as well when you're learning data science because you might need to be deploying some of your models as um, web applications to so work good. Okay. All right, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so does anybody have any other question? Okay, I'll take the silence as nobody has any other questions. So I would just like to speak briefly about the industries that benefit the most from data science. And um, please, I, I think I said it earlier that the old scope or the workflow, this particular data science workflow works across the industry, works across the project. This is the bit to it. Once you understand this bit and you can do this, I can assure you that you can pick up any data and work along with it and work with it. Trust me. So um, industries that benefit the most from data science, I'll start with the finance industry because we have a lot of companies in banking and finance here in Nigeria. So I'm going to start with the finance industry. And as we all know, the financial industry is one of the most numbers driven in the world, not even only in Nigeria yet. And um, from, from um, research, it's one of the first industries that adopted data science because um, data science actually helps them to monitor. It helps them as well at um, um, being able to, um, to, um, pick out, to pick out fraudulent behavior, payment, it helps them with payments, it helps them with customer analysis. Like I said before, a bank can as well still even have a customer churn, you know, segmentation. You can decide to do a model that actually does um, fake Naira, that detects fake Naira notes. You know, what you need to get there is your data, just make sure that you have the original data set, the genuine data set that contains the um, Naira notes for, for all different currencies. And then you probably will be having maybe 1,000 of them or 1 million of them in different forms that they are. Then you have as well fake Naira notes as well, and then do the model, train your model to be able to differentiate between these notes. There are so many things. You can decide to um, build a model that um, can pick out fraudulent, a fraudulent card transaction. You can so many things that can be done in the financial um, aspect when it comes to um, the financial industry. There are some other models, you know, that has to do with. So, having said that, I'm going to go to medicine. So, in medicine, data science is very, very, um, very useful. Medicine benefits from data science by um, being able to connect patterns. So if we can decide to study that, okay, most of the people who suffer from high blood pressure, they are always from the age, so, so, so age. If tomorrow I build a model and I have my facts to back it up and I have my data to back it up and my model too is telling me that diabetes, the way people actually call it and say that it is um, hereditary. If tomorrow my model says diabetes is not hereditary, that it just has to do with a particular human body, then that, so be it, because that is the fact that my data is telling me. But then, like I said earlier, you need to understand the domain. You need to understand the business. So if doctors are saying diabetes is, um, is um, hereditary, and my data and all the data that has been is saying that Diabetes is not the, um, hereditary. I can speak with the stakeholders and then we look at it together from end to end. I'm not just going to keep assuming that, okay, yes. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. It's just something I am saying. I'm not saying that is how it works. I'm just saying that. So you can use it for, you can use um, 
data science, you can as well use deep learning algorithms to be able to detect um, cancer, detect this, detect that. But you know all these things, they are not a one day job. They are not something that you just do in six hours and say, okay, yes, I've gotten it. They require a lot of research and a lot of development for all of this to be done. So, Speaking about medicine, I am um, telecommunications as well as as well also benefit from data science. Telecommunications are always looking to get proper revenue, much more revenue than the previous day, the previous week. They do not always want to lose their customers because customers are very key to them in the telecommunications industry. So they always do everything to want to keep their customers. And here is where data science comes to play. All fingers are not equal, so as all customers are not equal. So my data science model must be able to, you know, advise me on what to do for certain customers at certain levels. So that's what um, telecommunication, there are so many other things that telecommunications can benefit from data science. And then at transportation, transportation, I'm going to look at two things. I'm going to look at, at the logistics level and as well the um, transportation level. So I can use, um, as for transportation, I can put Bolt and Uber in place. So Uber actually uses, um, they actually use an algorithm, a technique to know um, how to um, connect a driver to a customer. And all of that is being done with data science. Um, then for the logistics part, uh, you are being able to monitor your goods and do all of that. The old data science thing will comes to play. You know, you are able to. Um, okay, for instance, now if I need to, let me just use this one as an example. It's something I'm just thinking of out of the out of my hands right now. Um, if I have a Venice bank close to um, a a GT bank, and then the next Venice bank branch is about. 10 kilometers away, and there's already a shortage of cash in Zenit Bank branch A. And the next bank and the next um, branch close to me is GT Bank branch B. But in recent time in Nigeria here, Zenit Bank will have to go to their branch that is like 10 kilometers away to get more cash. Meanwhile, GT Bank has an over, overflow of cash that can easily speak to them to reduce the cost of logistics because all of these things at the end of the day, any bank branch is going to 10 kilometers away to get money, there's a cost of logistics for that. So the cost of logistics can actually be reduced if any bank can be able to get money from GT and all of these settlements can be done behind, behind the scenes and nobody is seeing that. So logistics as well, the cost is it's, it's actually, sorry, the sample of the model I just gave now is actually very cost effective for everybody in that um, banking and finance and as well cost of logistics. Though, I'm not going to lie to you, data science might actually spoil business for some people, but trust me, it's going to build business for some people as well. Everything in life is now actually very fair like that. Then manufacturing and natural resources, we know when to manufacture what and who to manufacture. Um, manufacturing Dunlop slippers for so 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 people in Agege because it has it. all of that actually um, solves that once the data is in place. Then the same as energy, also um, e-commerce as well. We can see it's very visible what data science is doing in e-commerce. You know, if I buy something on Jumia now, Jumia is going to show me. Okay, this other cost, um, some other customers bought this particular similar product, or you can buy this product and this product together. All of that has actually has to do with data science and machine and the machine learning bit. And um, Netflix, when I look when I log into Netflix, Netflix gives me a recommendation of movies depending on my age. So all of this as well is done through the, the data science bit and machine learning bit. So it just depends on whatever or whichever is available at the moment, whichever or whatever data is available at the moment. So for newbies, like I said earlier, I would not like you to restrict or limit yourself to a particular industry. And that is why I'm not speaking about any particular industry or any particular organization. 
the organization, um, sorry, the industries are very well um, wide. There are very many. So you can look at your skill set and see how you can be a resourceful person or resourceful guy in the industry. So please, I think at this point, this is where I um, call it a do. I don't know, does anybody have any question for me? Please, may I know why you said that data science could spoil business for some people? Uh, okay, I think I, I said that that was a joke actually, but then um, regardless of, there's actually nothing in this world that doesn't have an advantage and disadvantage. I hope you, I hope we all agree on that. So if you are um, like the logistics guys that I said now, the money they are supposed to collect for 10 kilometers, they probably will have it short for a one kilometer trip because the model has been able to predict that I can get money from GT, which is very close to me, instead of going 10 kilometers away. Hasn't it cut down on their revenue? As it so that's why I meant, not like I was saying that it's entirely bad. It's not entirely bad. It's just the, you know. That's it. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions for me? Any questions, guys? Okay, so um, I, um, from well, from your experience with all the projects you've normally gone through, what is um the average? timeline it usually takes you to finish a project um so it depends really it depends on the project the project type it depends on the project type. some projects come in as um very easy as abc some are very some look easy in the beginning and then going on it's like a whole lot and for most times um i think most times the average I give is about one month. Most times, even if sometimes I finish before one month, but then keep training and testing for a period of one month. Okay. Yeah. Um, please. Um... Hello, can I ask a question, please? Yes, you can please. Yeah, in the based on, on the demands of uh, organizations today, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think the the position of a data scientist is needed? I mean, to to consider the the fact that most of the um, employers, entrepreneurs, knows the the value of data science. I don't mm -hmm. know, or I'm not sure if 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 the idea of, of data science has been open to most entrepreneurs or organizations. So based on this, how well do you feel that uh, the services of, of a data scientist is called on? Mm, well, in the world at large, it's actually a very, it's a, um, a developing um, field. In the world at large, it's, a, um, it's already becoming a need. The, the demand for data scientists in the world at large is becoming so, so broad. But if we, are if we are narrowing it to Nigeria, from what I have seen in Nigeria, I wouldn't like to you. It is actually becoming a very high demand as well here in Nigeria. I would not like to you. And it is not a field that is going to be swept off the carpet in, even in the next 10 years. Data science will still stand. Because a lot of companies want to, you know, they want to build cost-effective products. They want to be able to manage, manage their their customers. They want to, you know, nobody wants to lose out on anything. So people are seeing the need for these things. They are seeing the need, and that's why, like, the demand for data scientists these days are very, you know. I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. Um.
Um, does anybody else have any question for me? Okay, in the absence of no question, I hope I've been able to pass um, a few knowledge to us today. And I hope I've been able to inspire and motivate a lot more people to take the data science um, course they are learning or the experience they're currently having with data science. I hope I've been able to ginger them to take it more serious. And I hope I've been able to pass, you know, pass across a little of my knowledge in this field to all of us here. Yes, thank you. Right. Yes, sure. thanks so much for Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. How do we get in contact with you? Um, I'll have to discuss that we're doing, we're doing things. Okay. Hi, thank you very much. I mean, Bola, I enjoyed the session and I'm sure that every other person on the call enjoyed the session as well. So um, thank you very much. I think that um, if they want to contact you, is, is it okay to share your LinkedIn with them? Maybe yeah, you can just share it. Yeah, okay. 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 All right. All right, makes sense. All right, so I'll just drop it in the chat box. Thank you again. Um, Abimbola, I will be putting up the recorded version of this session um, latest by tomorrow. We'll work on it today and then put it up latest by tomorrow. So once it's up, we'll just nudge everybody. So yes, thank you very much. We enjoyed the session. Thank you everybody for joining the call. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye Abimbola. Bye. Yes, bye.